Romans chapter 2. We will be reading verses 1 through 6. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Let us read collectively, please. Verse 1. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. And we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thank you, thou of this, O man, that judges them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Or despisest thou the richness of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasure is up unto thyself wrath against the day of revelation, uh, uh, against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render it to every man according to his deeds. Amen. Verse 1. We're getting directly into Paul instructing the self-righteous, the self-deceived. And let me make out a point that many commentators concerning verses 1, verses 1 through 11, is Paul talking directly to the Jews? Is he talking to Jew and Gentile at the same time? And I wrestled with that for not too long. The issue at hand is that God is proving Jew and Gentile both Amen. is in need of his salvation. That they, are, that they both are guilty, that they both fall short, all has sin to come short of the glory of God. This is what he's after proving again. Just wanted to bring that out. Just wanted to bring that out. Now... Immediately, I want us to grasp that he is speaking in verses 1 through 6 to those who truly see themselves as already righteous and that they shall escape the judgment of God. Let's look at verse 1 again. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, listen close, for thou that judges doest the what? Same the same things. As Romans 1 came to an end, we knew without a shadow of a doubt that God was making known why the, why the Gentiles was cast off. And why, when you turn to Genesis chapter 12, he presents himself to Abram and lets Abram know, I will make of you a great, what's the N word? Nation. Nation. So, well, I want us to understand in these verses 1 through 6, the same accusations that God made against the Gentiles, if he is talking to the Jew at the beginning of Romans chapter 1, he's going to accuse them with the exact same accusations. I want, to, I want us to see some of these accusations. Let's go to verse Romans chapter 1, verse 18. The first thing he's going to prove is, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man who do what? Hold the truth and unrighteousness. God is going to prove to the Jew that you are in need of salvation. You fall short of my glory. You too hold the truth and unrighteousness. We understand that the truth that the Jews that Israel had was found within the, within the law. God's going to prove to them how they fall short of it. 
But also, let's look at verse 25 of chapter 1. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. He's going to show them how they changed the truth of what he revealed to himself in the law into a lie. He's going to put them in the same category that he puts the Gentile in. And what we're going to see when we go back to a couple verses in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to see them do, come out of Romans chapter 2, read verse 4 with me. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. You're going to see that they despise the goodness of God, sending his son through his promises, and they are going to oppose that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the promised Christ that was to confirm what? The promises that was made unto the fathers. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But they're going to reject those promises because they see themselves as someone who does what? Not deserve judgment, not deserve the wrath of God, or like verse 3 says in Romans chapter 2, and thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do it the same, do it such things, and do us the same, that thou shalt do what? Escape the judgment of God. Escape the judgment of God. Amen. <clears throat> what is it? What is it to be to be deceived? Someone who is self-deceived, they are they are believing a lie. They are believing a lie. They are they are baited with fraud and false accusations about themselves or others. Amen. And that's exactly what self-deception, that's exactly what self-righteousness does. It baits you with a fraud and it's intended to mislead you. And what self-righteousness does is just that. It baits an individual in believing that they are not just worthy of the judgment of God. And that's what Romans chapter 2 verses 1 through 6 is dealing with. Those who believe that they will escape the judgment of God. They don't see it as just. They don't see that they fall short of his glory. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Come with me to Luke chapter 18. This should be a very familiar passage. Luke chapter 18. What we are going to do, we are going to look at those who believe that they shall escape the judgment of God. Now what I want us to understand also through the outset is we may look at this a little different than, than we or than you ever have looked at this before because what I don't want us to miss is from Romans chapter 1 verse 18 through Romans chapter 3 verse 20 what is God after proving Salvation needed by all. Everyone needs the salvation of the Lord. So what Paul, what God has to do is what? And excuse the curse of hope it didn't mess any of you up. But he has to prove that we fall short of his glory. That's all he's after. But in doing so, please don't think that he's just proving how, how, how mean he is, how arrogant he is, because he isn't. What he's after proving and exposing is that you fall short of my glory. But once we get to Romans chapter 3, verse 21, he's after proving the salvation that you need, I provide. But he's proving that you need it, though, okay? That's what's going on. So now, Luke chapter 18, let's start at verse 9. 
And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in what? Themselves. That they were righteous and despised others. What is it to despise someone? So not just, and, and, and I'm going to get back to you, not just are they righteous, they, they are self-righteous in, in his sight, this Pharisee, but he despised others. What is it to despise someone? To hate. To hate. To hate, to look down on with contempt. Let's continue. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Notice he's not praying to God. He's praying with himself. Listen to what he says. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men out. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. You see, I'm looking down on the publican. I'm not like them. Verse 12. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Here's the publican. And the publican, standing afar off, will not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, or what? I tell you this, says Christ. This man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. This is a picture of what we're looking at in Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. These individuals who believe that they shall escape the judgment of God, they are exalting what they do before the goodness of God. They're exalting, I fast twice a week. I do this. I do, and guess what? I'm not like other men. This is God still being and expressing his goodness, his forbearance, and his long suffering in Romans chapter 2 by doing what? You too need my salvation. Those of you who are self righteous, those of you who are self deceived. I don't know about you. I didn't understand how great Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 3 and 20 was. It's God. In a very gentle but real subtle way, pleading with us to see our need for his salvation. He is reasoning and pleading, expressing his goodness, being honest with us about our shortcomings, but only to make us realize what we are in need of. That's what you call goodness. And that's why you see in <coughs> Romans chapter 2 verse 4, it's going to talk about the goodness of God supposed to do what? Lead to repentance. Lead to a change of mind. That is what you call grace. That's what you call grace. Let's go to another passage. Let's go to John chapter 9. We, we ought to be very careful that we always express the goodness of God Whenever we ask an individual to open their Bibles, when we express the goodness of God, we express the kindness of God. We express the grace of God. We express goodness is the essence of his nature. It's the essence of who he is. He is good. And his goodness, I say again, is supposed to lead us to a change of mind. Amen. Some people want to belittle you like the self-righteous uh, Pharisee did towards the publican, the tax collector. That's not even what Israel is supposed to have been up to, which we're going to look at in a couple more minutes. they supposed to have been having individuals look unto them and giving God glory. Amen? The world, was to, the world was supposed to see the mercy of God through the mercy that Israel resembled. Amen? John chapter 9 Let's start at verse 32. What I want us to do, I'm going to give us a backdrop. John chapter 9, when we pick up here at verse 32, you got a man who was born blind, who have now received his sight. 
Now, the Pharisees and those who are questioning this, this individual who have received his sight, they are trying to come against what Christ have done. They don't want any props. They don't want any glory to go to the man who gave you your sight back. And what are they doing? They're despising the goodness of God. Okay? But let's start at verse 32. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and doest thou teach us? And they cast him out. You see what they're doing already? They're looking down on him just like the Pharisee did in Luke 18. Thou wast born in sins. Were you not? <laughs> Were you not? I was, um, I, I used to work at a place where there was a lot of Catholics. And I was sharing the gospel with one of them. And I'm, I'm going back maybe eight, eight, nine years. And one who I was sharing the gospel with, she told me, I have no need of the gospel that you share with me. And, and the reason that she said is she said, I was born a Christian. I was born. My father and mother uh, there's some ritual, right? I think it has Baptism. 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 I was born saved. Born saved. It, it, there's so many doctrines out there. So, there's so many false, uh, crazy heresies out there that she saw no need for me to share with her what I was sharing with her. She didn't see that she, that, that she falls short of the glory of God. Neither did these Pharisees who's talking to this man right now who's expelling him from their temple. Amen? Continuing on. Uh, at the end of verse 34, and they cast him out. Verse 35 reads, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto them, Doest thou, here's the B word, doest thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him. God has both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I what? Believe, and he worshiped him. Let's pay close attention. And Jesus said, For judgment, I am coming to this world that they would see that they would see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? 41, Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now, we, but now ye say we see, therefore your sin remaineth. What are they saying to Jesus? We don't need what you got to offer. We don't believe you are of God or come from God. You, what you got to offer, we don't need. If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, we see, therefore your sin remains. I'm good. Don't need your help, Jesus. Not yours. Now, why is this such a big deal? Come to John chapter 20. During, during Christ's earthly ministry, salvation was found in believing that Jesus was the Christ, that he was the one that Moses and the prophets said will come, and here you go, I'm here. They didn't believe that. <coughs> John chapter 20, let's start at verse uh, start at verse 30. We won't get into a lot of details. I want you to see some things here. Verse 30 reads, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. 31. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the what? Christ, Christ the Son of God. And here's during Christ's earthly ministry, what's the big deal about that? And that believing ye might have life through his name. When they believe not who Jesus claimed time after time after time who he was, 
they damned themselves, right? Or come back to Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Let's let Romans chapter 2, verse 4, or I think it's 5, 2. So there. Yeah. Verse 5. This is what they were doing every time they rejected who Christ was and hung on to that. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasure it up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. A hard heart, you know a hard heart is in your presence or when someone dies and they die without believing the dispensational gospel at that time. At that time, in John, the dispensational gospel was for them to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you have life through his what? Amen. Name, not Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Let's, let's always rightly divide that, right? So they didn't have believe, they, they did not have to believe that Christ died for their sins, but they did have to believe another cross-reference Luke chapter 24, they had to believe that everything that Moses, the prophets, and the law spoke of, that Christ would fulfill. And they still believed what? Not. And in doing so, they was treasuring up unto themselves wrath against the day of wrath and revelation. Here's this. Of the righteous judgment of God. Righteous. Righteous judgment of God. That, aren't we impressed with a God who will judge us rightly? I don't know about you, but many people sometimes, rather you get a traffic ticket or rather you know someone or you yourself been to, to a court for something very, very serious, you will hear sometimes people say, oh, that judge is in a mood this morning. I hope you brought your wallet with you. Going by moods. Well, that's not our concern. Mm -hmm. Our God is going to judge righteously and always have judged righteously. Amen? Amen? Amen. But let's take a look at what is this day of wrath and revelation of the righteous <coughs> judgment of God. I come to Revelation chapter 20. We, we've been there before, but let's, let's, let's revisit that. This is what an unbeliever throughout any dispensation in the Bible, this is what they are stirring up and piling up for themselves. Revelation chapter 20, we're going to start at verse 11. We're looking at the great white throne judgment. Who is that judgment for? Unbelievers. Unbelievers. The unsaved. Through all the dispensations. Amen? Amen. All the, the, those who died at Noah in the flood time, they're going to be right here as well. And here is proof. You're going to see it when we read. Okay? Starting at verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those books, which were written in the books according to their what? Their works. For those of us in this dispensation, we won't be there. And everything, our salvation is based on who works? Christ works. Amen? That's something that, that we drive home in this IBA dispensation. What I mean by I, IBA, this identity-based acceptance dispensation. Our righteousness is totally based on the faithfulness and the identity of Christ. Amen? Okay, continuing verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their what? This is so beautiful. Once again, are we judged according to our works? And because we are not, there is a no condemnation seal on us until always and forever. <laughs> Amen. Verse, 20, verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Amen. That great white throne. 
That judgment, amen. Verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the what? Lake of fire. I want you to see something else. Stay right here. <clears throat> Stay right there. Okay. Come with me to Revelation 21. Let's see some other, God bless you. Let's see some other things about the lake of fire. This 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 day of wrath and, and judgment of the revelation of God and his judgment. Verse 8, 21 and 8. But the fearful, and here's an important word, unbelieving, 21 and 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the what? Second death. Once again, this place is for, the second death is for those who refuse to believe whatever the gospel was and whatever dispensation, they kept that higher and penitent heart, no heart of repentance, no change of mind to see good this, get this, Throughout the entirety of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, there was never a time that God was not offering the goodness of his salvation. He offered it at different times in different ways, but it was always offered. It was always offered. And I don't know about you, that's goodness. That's goodness. Because when we read Romans chapter 1 verse 18 through Romans chapter 3 verse 20, we're seeing God offer his goodness, but yet while he offers his goodness, he's not keeping us obsolete and blindsided about we're not good. <laughs> I'm offering you my goodness because you're not. Amen. So we don't want to forget that, but that's good. That's the goodness of God. You're, you're offering me what I need and what I need. I can't bulk up on, I can't build up on, I got to get it from you. Will you provide it for me? Yes, I will. Yes, I will. But when we have that impenitent, that hard heart, they, we or those, not even we, the unbelievers, the unsaved, they store up that wrath for themselves. All for that day. And when that day starts, always and forever in that lake of fire. Amen. And we know for that to be a truth, and we're now trying to persuade others to believe in the finished work of Christ. Believe in the finished work of Christ. Amen. Glory to God. Matthew chapter 22. Just wanted to see that when you read Romans chapter 2, verses, uh, verse 2 and 5, that's what it's talking about. That's, that, that's what they're storing up. That higher heart is going for them. Amen. Matthew chapter 22, once again, we're looking at now the self-righteous, the self-deceived. We're, we're looking at them. We're, we're looking at them. Matthew chapter 22, let's start at verse 15, okay? 22 and 15, and it reads, Then when the Pharisees, then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And it's exactly still the same today. It's still the same today. When we come and we try to share the gospel with somebody or those who don't believe even how to rightly divide the truth, be careful because they want to entangle us in our talk. They want us to trip in our words. They want us to trip in our words. And that's exactly what these Pharisees always did, always did, always did to Christ. Let's talk question after question after question after question so that they may trip him up in his words. This is why, once again, before the uh, lesson today, I ask that a special prayer request that we consider a Bible study, uh, a Bible reading, that we read the Bible at least once a year. And if, and if you don't do that, I pray that you do stay well-versed in the Pauline letters. Amen? Read it all, but stay well-versed in the Pauline letters, please. Please, because people want to trip us up and I talk about this mystery age, the dispensation of the grace of God. Paul being the apostle of the Gentiles, they really want to trip us up. Okay? Back to this uh, verse um, 15. 
Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent unto him, and they sent unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. What are they being? Very deceitful, right? Very deceitful, right? In truth, neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? This is awesome, verse 18. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and subscription? 21. They said unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar's the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God. Watch verse 22. And when they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. What I want you to see is what they didn't do. They was amazed. They marveled. They went their way. It didn't say they were convicted and repented in heart. It didn't say they changed their mind. It didn't say, wow, you are the son of God. What in such wisdom you have? No. They marveled at his words. Let's go. We'll be back. That's it. This is how they felt about it. This is a hard heart. They refuse to believe what they should that they may truly have eternal life. Not going to believe that. Not going to believe that. Not going to believe that. Now come back to me to Romans chapter 1. Let's take a look at Romans 1 again. Romans chapter 1. Once again, <coughs> hear me and hear me. Let's read from verse 29 down. Romans chapter 1, verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, everything we're reading from Romans chapter 1, verse 29 to 32, bring all of that to you. They do it's the same. The same. How about that word debate? That word debate, it means strife, curling, contentious, fighting verbal with a disputing manner and loving to do so. This is exactly what these Pharisees did day after day with Christ. Loving to do so. Loving to just debate and debate. Not for the sake of an iron sharpens iron. Not for the sake of, I'm kind of like uncertain whether I'm looking at this the right way. You mind going over this with me one more time? I know we did last week, but I need just give me five more minutes of your time. Not for that sake, but for the sake of, we don't believe you are who you say you are. We don't. Everything you saw in Romans chapter 1 from 29 down, I say and I say again. Bring it over with you when you get to Romans 2. Let's continue to look at a couple more uh, traits. Look at 30. Backbiters. Haters of God. Hey, God. Christ was proven to them. You hate God. Believe him who sent me. Did, did they believe that he was sent from God? No. Did not. And then he would say in, in other passages, if you don't believe in who I say, and who I say that I say it, I am, at least believe in the works that I do. Go back to the prophets and the law of Moses, and they will say that I would do certain things in a certain way. The works will show you. You don't believe my words, believe my works. Haters of God. Haters of God. 30. Despiteful, proud. Boasters, adventures of evil things, disobedient to parents. God is revealing to the Jews, listen, you're just like the Gentiles. You're just like them. The law that I gave you, you're using against me. I gave you this law so that the nations would be impressed with what I gave you and be impressed with me, and you're using it as a weapon against me. Is that not the definition of a hater of God? Is that not despiteful? 
That's exactly what spiteful is. And I love verse 31. The first thing you see in verse 31. Without understanding. Without understanding. Opposing God to a degree to hire so hard. They don't even got the understanding to even convict them to re-examine what they're doing. And in the midst of it all, God don't want us to forget. I'm just revealing salvation is needed by y'all. I'm not even calling out the self-righteous and the self-deceived for the sake of calling them out. I'm calling them out. Verse Romans 2, chapter 4. Knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. I want you to see me call you out to, for me to escort you to how I can bring you out. Bring you out of your self-righteousness. Don't trust in your self-righteousness. Trust in my righteousness. <coughs> Don't trust in your words. Trust in my words. This is good. And this always, from Genesis to Revelation, God always expressed to man how gracious he was, how patient he was, how long-suffering he was, how his forbearance always reigned supreme. Always. What's the definition of goodness? What is goodness? How how how? What does God mean? What does the word mean when it say in verse 4, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness? Get they, not just goodness, he's rich in his goodness. He's rich in it. Rich in his goodness and forbearance and long suffering. Get this, this is a link to without understanding. Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. See, they lack. The understanding is they're so without understanding, they don't even see why they are opposing him. God's goodness, which means his kindness, his gentleness. It's the essence of who he is to put up with sinful mankind. It's, it's not out of his character to put up with the self-righteous, the self-deceived. He don't got to work up the sweat. I got to put up with that. He don't got to work the sweat up. This is who he is. You ever have some people that got a sharp, sarcastic tongue, whether it's 6 a.m. or whether it's 6 p.m.? Wait, would you sharp with it? Before you can get your word out, they already didn't just say something in a sarcastic manner that blow you away. Just the opposite is nothing for God to just extend grace. It's nothing for him to extend his kindness, to do his things. He don't got to work himself up. It's nothing. This is the essence of who he is, and it's just for us to turn and have a changed mind about, wow, yeah, I do do the same thing, and I'm looking down on them doing it. Do the same thing. That's all we have to. He just want to expose it for the sake that he can, what, extend more. Look at the end of verse 4. Knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Extend goodness so that you can see my goodness. And then you won't be without understanding. <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. That is awesome. Ah. Be patient with this next term where we're going to go in the scriptures. Come to me, with me to the book of Jonah. Come with me to the book of Jonah. It's between Jonah. I want to say it's between the book of Obadiah and Micah. Jonah. Between the book of Obadiah and Micah. After the book of Amos. <clears throat> I'm going to throw out some, some books, some chapters, and some verses. Okay? Books, chapters, and verses. Not in the book of Jonah, and I'm going to ask for Grace Family. I'm going to ask for those present here to help me out. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, you can paraphrase it, you can turn it. What is God in his goodness, what promise have he made immediately when man fell? 3.15, he, he said, the seed of the woman shall bruise the what? The head of the servant. He's already looking on how to express his goodness by condemning sin. Amen? Amen? 
already looking at the cross. Immediately after the fall, this is, this is how you really know he's good. Immediately when we do the one thing we should have not done, okay, remedy, I'm going to step in. But until that cross, I'm just going to expend kindness and goodness, and I'm going to give them different things to believe at different times to yet save them. To yet save them, amen? Okay, so that's what's up in Genesis 3.15. In Genesis 12, verses 2 through 3, what's the picture there? Genesis 12, Abram, and he tells Abram, I will make of you a great, and that nation will be a blessing, amen? That nation, now I'm, I'm saying this all for the sake of why we turn to Jonah. That nation is supposed to be a blessing to all families on the earth. Get this, that nation is not just supposed to be a blessing and stand alone, but God has the what? The whole earth in mind still. Amen? Although that nation is going to be the go-between, but he has all families in mind. Now, this is important for us to understand, okay? So, Israel, of course, should have known this, right? Israel should have known this. Let's go to the book of John. Israel, of course, should have known this. Was Jonah a Jew or a Gentile? A Jew. He was a Jew. He was, he was on the stock of Israel. Amen? O -o okay, so he supposed to know these things. And I'm, also, I'm, I'm, I'm searching for some interaction right now. Jonah was swallowed in the belly of a big fish. And, and, and it's important to say that because the, 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 the well word is not found in the book of Jonah in our King James translation. Maybe another translation. But it says big fish. So it's safe to think that it was a well. I'm just saying the scriptures don't say that it was. It does say a big fish, though, okay? Now, Jonah opens up with God sending him to a Gentile nation, city of Nineveh, okay? So I want you to keep Genesis 12 in mind. The nation Israel is supposed to be a blessing to how many families on earth? Uh -huh. oh. No matter how wicked, no matter how evil, God is still offering what's the Jew. <coughs> his good, his grace, his goodness to lead to repentance. Okay? Now, once again, Jonah should have known this, right? Jonah should have known this. Should have known this. Now, this is relevant for Jonah, and you're going to see before we close, this is relevant for us today, too. Sometimes we lose track of what we're supposed to be extending to others. Okay? I want us to start at chapter 3, though. Chapter 3, Jonah is out of the fish now, okay? Jonah is out of the fish. You know what? Go to chapter 2 with me. I'm sorry. Let's start at verse 8. Verse 7. <clears throat> He's in the belly of the fish still. Verse 7 reads, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, and to thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Verse 9. This is what Jonah says in verse 9. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pray, or I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord, and the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Did Jonah desire to go to Nineveh? Did he want to go to Nineveh? Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. So the fish swallowed Jonah. So in the early chapter of Jonah, you saw that it was a crazy storm, and the boat was about to be torn in pieces that Jonah was upon, right? So now it seems as though Jonah has a repentance of, of heart, a change of mind. Chapter 3, start at verse 1. Follow along. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And, jo and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet yeah, he's in the city. This is what he said. Nineveh, listen. Yet yeah, forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh did what? Should this make Jonah happy? 
This should make Jonah happy. Jonah should be extremely happy. Why? Jonah should recognize and be careful of the same thing we're looking at in Romans chapter 2, verse 1. You ain't no better. Look, you really do the same thing. You ain't no better. You ain't no better. I want you to understand, as we continue to read, you may see Jonah look down on the people in Nineveh and might not be happy that they believe God. That's kind of crazy, ain't it? <laughs> continue. Continue with me, please. Uh, I'm, I'm at... Uh, what verse do you have? Verse 5, thank you, brother. So the people of Nineveh, of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. This is huge in the Old Testament. And put on sackcloth from the grace of them even to the least of them. Six, for, for a word came unto the king of Nineveh. Get this. And he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. You got some what? You got some change of heart. You got some repentance going on. You got some repentance going on. Continuing. Seven. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his noble saying, let neither man nor beast nor flock taste anything. Nobody eating. Not even the animals eat. Nobody eating. It sounds like, guess what? Not just really... This is not a false belief on them at this time. They really <laughs> believe that their city was going to be overthrown and burned up if they do not what? Turn from their ways. Performance-based acceptance time pass. Amen? Mm -hmm. Saying, let neither man nor beast, middle of verse 7, herd nor flock taste anything. Get this. Let them not feed nor drink water. Not just as y'all not eating. Ain't nobody drinking. God, see, 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 we heard the word that you gave Jonah to tell us. Continue. But let man and beast, verse 8, be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, meaning yes, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent? And turn away his fierce anger that we what? Perish not. They believe that if they didn't turn, that they would perish. They believe this. Verse 10. And God saw their works and they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. And repented. God changed his mind. He changed his mind because what did they do? They stopped storing up that judgment with a hard heart. They stay, they, they, you know what? That wrath, we don't want your wrath. We, now, this is important in Romans chapter 2 for us to bring out when you disbelieve, when you do not believe the word of God that is given to you in the proper dispensation that is that it is in. When you do not believe it, believe it, you turn the wrath of God upon you. Now they believed it, and God did what? He repented. He changed his mind. What he said he would do, overthrow the enemy in 40 days, he's not going to do. Now, here's the punchline. Chapter 4. Let's see, let's see Jonah response. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. The more you read the book of Jonah, the number one thing I noticed as I read the book of Jonah God is still revealing to us man and revealing to us himself. Sometimes we have such a uh, despiteful thing towards whether it's genders, races, or whatever it is. You're supposed to be the voice of God proclaiming his goodness. You should desire for a man to turn unto God. They turn unto God. What is your problem? you very displeased. Very, this dude is mad. Beautiful what he about to say in the next verse about God. Watch what he say about God in verse 2. And he prayed unto thee. And, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my sin when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God. And merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, 
and repentance the other evil. Well, what's the problem? <laughs> what is the problem, Jonah? The problem is, and here's the beautiful, also the goodness of God. In order to get God's word out and try to show Jonah a lesson about God's goodness, his own goodness, God can use, hear me, hear me, hear me. This is important for me and all of us to understand. God can even use the racists among us to dispense his grace, to proclaim his word. Shame on me. Shame on them. Shame on whoever that still stay that type of way when they see those of a, another race, another gender, or whatever come to God and see God use them. Shame. But you, you get a twofold thing of this. God is schooling Jonah about himself and at the same time schooling Jonah about God. Learn of me and learn of you. Think of like, Jonah got a problem with God being, get this, good, gracious, merciful, loving God. Isn't this why I didn't want to go? Because I know, I know what they believed you, they would change their mind and you would change your mind. And that's your argument? And as gracious as God is, guess what? God don't even drop them there. God can see and have conversation with him. See, that's, that's good. That's good. After he belittles the goodness of God and reasons against it, God is going to have a conversation with him. God ain't going to say, okay, dude, you tripping. Clouds on my glasses. You tripping. <laughs> you know what I mean? God ain't even flipped the script because this is his essence. This is who he is. I'll reason with you some more, Jonah. Let's continue to read. Therefore now, O oh Lord, take I beseech thee my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. This man want to die. Who got the problem here? God or Jonah? Next verse. Then said the Lord, do it not well to be angry? And I like the question mark. Meaning, I'm waiting for your response, Jonah. Talk to me, Jonah. You, you will to be angry? Fine. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and stood under it in the shadow till, till he might see what would become of the city. What does that tell you? He leaned it back, made him something, he got some shade. See if God really not going to destroy this city. I'm about to just see what's going to happen. Is, is it flames going to start or is everything just peace now because they believe and repented of their evil ways. I'm watching. I'm watching. I'm mad and I'm watching. I am so displeased with God. I'm straight up. This is Jonah's disposition. Six, and the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the what? The gourd, this plant that's providing shade. Get this. Jonah is upset with God. You know what God do? It's real hot. I'm going to make a plant to cover you with some shade. And sometimes we really got to look at how good God is. You mad at me. You should be excited for what I did. I'm going to create a plant to cover you because you upset or whatever. You need some shade. I'm going to take care of you. Cool. Ain't that something? I'll help you cool down. You need to cool down, John. I'm going to help you cool down. Next verse. Seven. But God prepped or God prepared a worm when the morning rose Next day, and it smoked the ground and it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Jonah got problems, y'all. Verse 9 And God said to Jonah, Do us thou well to be angry. Get this. Here's the lesson Do us thou well to be angry for the gore? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Watch how God reason with him. Then said the Lord, thou hast had pity on the gore, on this plant, for the which thou hast not labored, neither made as it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. It's it just a day. It, it had life, this plant. Just a day. Eleven, and should not I spare Nineveh, that great city? Wherein are more than six score thousand people that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. And this is one of the few books of the Bible that closes with a question mark. And it don't tell you that Jonah got the lesson 
You don't know anything. It closes with you understanding the goodness of God, but yet presenting a question to the reader. Should I not? If you have pity on a plant, should I not have pity on people? People who lack understanding, people who remind you of Romans chapter 1, verse 29 on down, haters of God, despiteful, deceitful, whisperers, backbiters. This is something. Those who hate me, God said, ambassadors for Christ, you ambassadors, I'm going to send you to them and beseech them. Be ye reconciled to God. Now that was my cross reference for taking us to Jonah. Just for us, and I know that's real different than the way you would normally maybe look at Romans chapter 2 verses 1 through 6. But I want you to understand that it's still a plea for us to see salvation needed by all. And God, hear me and hear me and hear me. He only reveals the truth about our evilness to reveal why someone had to take the cross to die for them, to condemn sin in the flesh. That's our job. But may we not become like Jonah and have this attitude of despising a city that he declared, why you saved them? Upset, mad, horrible, horrible, horrible. And let's come back to come, come to me, Matthew 28 as we close. Got two more verses. Matthew 28. And my reason for coming to Matthew 28 is not for us to, to, to look at a gospel that we should preach, but for us to see the goodness of God all times and all ways, that he always had the earth, the earth, the entire human race in mind since the fall of man. The entire human race was in mind. Matthew chapter 28, let's start at verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach how many nations? All. All. Even that commission that he gave his apostles concerning the earthly ministry, go teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son of the Holy Ghost. Last portion of scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's, it, it, it's so important for, for me, for us, for members of his body to never lose sight with God is now reconciling the world. Yes, through the cross of Christ, but through his ambassadors getting his word out there. And may we be quick in a hurry and exceedingly joyful to do so. Let's start at verse 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, and it reads, And all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and have given unto us. Who is the us? Members of the body of Christ, you and me, right? Those of us who are saved, this is the us. He has given to us the what? Ministry of reconciliation. That's our service. That's our service. Verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the, what's that W word? The world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and have committed unto us with the ministry of reconciliation. He committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. And get this, an ambassador go from place to place, foreign place to foreign place. Wasn't that a good example of what Jonah supposed to have been doing to the nations? He should have been. Then for this week, we're next week. Then for this week, we're next week. That wasn't Jonah's disposition, though, was it? May we be careful that that, that that does not become our disposition. Amen? Amen. We want them to see the goodness of God. He knew what God was capable of doing, and it upset him when he did it. May it not be us. We want people to stop treasuring up this wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Man, stop doing that, brother. Stop doing that, sister. Stop doing that, cousin. Stop doing that, neighbor. We want them to stop treasuring up what we know they're going to have to cope with if they keep that hard heart. We know what's coming. Matter of fact, Last verse, I want you to see that verse. I want you to see that verse. I want you to see that verse. So 
Somebody help me. Pastor, I'm looking for, and I know it's in 2 Corinthians. I got it. 2 Corinthians, still chapter 5. Look at verse 11 and we close it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Paul reads, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. We know the, the terror of the Lord. We know he has to be held accountable to keep his word. So if he said a lake of fire one day is going to happen, a second death is going to happen, we know a judgment is going to happen. That should do what? Persuade us. Persuade us. Persuade us. Thanks be and glory be to God. God bless you.